Live from New York City, it's The Cube at Big Data NYC 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, WAN Disco, with support from EMC, MarkLogic, and Teradata. With hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Kelly. Welcome back to New York City, everybody. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Kelly. We're here for two days. We've got three events going on. We're running theCUBE live wall-to-wall -wall coverage of Big Data NYC, which is concurrent with Hadoop World and Strata. We first did our, uh, we did our first Hadoop World in 2010. So we got two days of CUBE coverage. This afternoon at four o'clock, we have a capital markets event. We've got uh, over 150 people registered to come in and hear Jeff Kelly uh, talk about some new big data information from our, new, our latest survey, and then we've got a panel, a great panel, uh, of a Amy O'Connor, who's the former uh, big data team lead at Nokia, Abi Mehta, former B of A, now it's CEO of Traceda, and, and uh, Peter Goldmacher, who was the lead analyst for enterprise software and big data at Cowan, uh, as well as Jeff Kelly. That's uh, this afternoon at four, and then this evening we have our celebrating five years of CUBE at Hadoop World party. We are here at the Hilton Times Square, uh, which is offsite at the Javits, but buses are running, we've got cars going, so stop by and see us. David Richards is here, CEO of Wendisco. Great to, to see you again, always a pleasure. Always great to be here, love the show. So you guys, uh, just uh, we had cause on at uh, Oracle Open World. I, I was texting saying, hey, can you get up here? And uh, <laughs> you know, we want to shake things up a little bit, so that was fun. Um, it's just amazing to see what's going on with, with Hadoop. You know, Jeff and I have been sort of sifting through the data, and I call it the big sucking sound. Yeah. Um, you know, the enterprise data warehouse isn't going away, but boy, are people rethinking where they put their money. Do you, do you see that, and you know, give us your take. So I had a wander down Wall Street and met with a bunch of CIOs a couple of weeks ago, and this actually is where the rubber is meeting the road in terms of Hadoop adoption and deployment. It's the banks. So it's like an inverted product adoption lifecycle curve. Virtually all of our early customers and uptake are with massive financial institutions. And I, sp I spoke to one, I can't name any of these banks, I'd love to, but I spoke to one particular CIO and I said, how are you going to cost justify this move uh, to Hadoop? Uh, how, how are you going to do that? And his answer was so succinct and so simple. They're going to tear out half of their existing data warehouse solution. I won't be disrespectful to, to the vendor whose technology that is. And they will save half a billion dollars a year. Half a billion dollars a year. I mean, when you hear numbers and stats like that, it's, you know, this is a seismic shift, a tectonic shift in the marketplace that I don't think we've ever seen before. And then the, the, the other side of that coin uh, is that people are making money with Hadoop because oh yeah. they're, they're doing things faster, they're identifying fraud more quickly, they're able to identify risk more quickly. Oh, Talk about the other side. Some of the use cases are just amazing. So we did a, we did a production trial with one of the world's largest banks and they had a very simple question, which was, are we making money in a particular geographic region? Now you'd imagine a bank should be able to add all those numbers up and figure it out. Well, it turns out that a lot of the data is in a very unstructured format. And by that I mean PDF files, Word documents. Within 30 days, they were able to determine actually that they weren't making money in this geographic region. Another case, I went to see an, a massive insurer, insurance company uh, in and around the metropolitan New York area. They, uh, they've been in business for 100 years, right? They're actuarial scientists. The assumptions behind their business have been in play for 100 years. This is a 100-year-old business. Their top, w when, they, when they implemented big data and just ran a simple text algorithm, regression analysis on text, they determined that their top three risk elements, their actuarial risk elements, were all wrong. Mm. Now, can you imagine what the board of directors at those two companies would have thought? A, they're not making money in a particular geographic region. And secondly, um, that, that, that the assumptions associated with insurance risk are actually not the top three reasons for insurance risk. The opportunity is phenomenal, but also the risk to those businesses in not doing it is almost as great. So it's this risk reward. I think, and you know, that, that, that interesting stat that in 10 years, 66% of the S&P 500 66% of the S&P 500 in 10 years hasn't even been created yet. Right. That tells you that we're going to have disruption. And I think we're beginning to see now that big data, and it's a horrible phrase, we know that, 
but Hadoop is the disruptive force in the market that might be enabling that. And you're seeing that, that the hub of innovation is the financial services sector generally. New York City specifically? Are you seeing sort of similar trends in London, for example? Well, I mean, Wall Street obviously is the financial capital of the world, and no disrespect to my, um, my friends in London, but certainly the financial services industry is a major driver for this. Now, I know banks have had a history of, of adopting technology pretty early, but I've never, mm. seen, I've never seen a wave coming, coming like this. Mm -hmm. And th I think the most interesting thing as well is, we talked about economics earlier, but when you see a curve of the amount of data that we're going to have that's doing this, and when you see the curve of budgets for storage that's doing that, I, I would suggest that, there's a, that there is a probably a problem in the marketplace that Hadoop solves, which is that, that gap in budget. A and that data. gap is clearly widening, yeah, absolutely. more so than it ever has in the 30 years that I've been watching it. So. Yeah, I, I would just you know, add to that, that, that we're seeing you know, evidence of, to kind of back up that premise, talking to Wikibon community members who, you know, to talk about a lot of the different benefits of Hadoop, but one of them that they talk about, and it's not always the, the, the sexiest one, a lot of people like want to talk about analytics and all the cool things you can find, but a lot of it is storage costs. Absolutely. Now, I think Hadoop is, to really leverage Hadoop, you've got to look at it much more than just a storage platform, but that is an element where you can, it's a, you're talking a 10 times uh, economic uh, difference between the two technologies. It's, it's interesting, Mike Olson, uh, in his keynote at Strata today, um, founder of Cloudera, talked about Hadoop disappearing. It doesn't mean it's going to go away. What it means is it's going to be ubiquitous and it will disappear behind lots of other applications that will be built on top of this. I think, I do think Hadoop will commoditize as, as a platform very quickly, which, is, which uh, goes to this point as well about ubiquity and stretching right across the market. So you guys have chosen what I'll call a niche. Um, somebody once said to me, you're going to start a company, make sure you own a niche. <laughs> um, and you guys are solving a really super hard problem that most people just wouldn't even want to touch. I wonder if you could talk about that uh, and, and talk about the uptake that you're seeing uh, in your space. So we came to market with our patented active-active replication technology, applied it to Hadoop, and solved the single point of failure associated with the name node. In fact, the whole data center being a single point of failure. If a data center goes down, you're screwed, right? So we, we ensure that the data is not, not backed up because it's active-active, so there is no DR site. You have data that resides in different geographic locations. That was our first premise in, come to, in going to market. Actually, interestingly, and this is sort of brand new, hot off the press news, we're discovering that there are plenty of other use cases for our technology. One which is, we went to a very large consumer electronics company um, that had a problem you know, that's associated with the Internet of Things, which is a huge driver for that increase in data. They, they run a Kafka job, they cram in a colossal amount of data every 20 minutes into a Hadoop data lake or an enterprise data, whatever they call it these days. It, that cramming of data, that data ingest job, utilizes the entire system resources across the entire data lake. Mm -hmm. So you can't, that means that, you, while, that, while, that and while that ingest is going on, you can't run analytics, you can't do other batch jobs, you can't do anything else with the data lake other than ingest. And as that data climbs, this company were concerned that actually the full system utilization would be only used for doing data ingest. So what Wandisco can do is segment the data lake into what we call cluster zones. So you have zone A that's doing ingest, zone B that might be trimming the data, zone C that might be doing an in-memory analytics job, and so, and, and so on and so forth. I won't go through every single uh, potential use mm -hmm. case for that. But it also plays into a cost um, uh, perspective as well. A CIO from a company said, can you guys do this zoning thing? We thought about it and said, actually, yeah, that's a byproduct of what we do. It turns out, if you need to spec out the hardware in a data lake, you have to spec it out, it, 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 assuming that you have a you know, big data lake, you have to spec it out for the highest possible use case. So if it's a lot of in-memory processing, then that's what you need to spec it out to do is, is massive in-memory processing. With zones, it means that you could have one particular zone with a high spec set of machines, another zone with a lower spec of machines, and so on and so forth. So we probably reduce the cost, the hardware cost associated with Hadoop deployments by 33% minimum. I mean, we're seeing much bigger numbers than that. So I think those two use cases, and, and uh, add to that remote data ingest, because of course, if you're, if you're monitoring oil pipelines in Saudi Arabia with, with you know, or wind speed or whatever, uh, you're not going to surely build a, an ingest pipeline all the way from Saudi to the data center in California. You don't want to collect that data locally. <laughs> and we did announce two new products today that also deal with that problem so 
a data center aware yarn. Now, what is that? Okay, you, this means that you can run a MapReduce job, create a single uh, global namespace against data that resides in different geolocations. So we made yarn data center aware. And I'm also really excited um, with a, a product that's come out of our big data labs. It's not ready, it's not prime time yet. Um, it enables a single global namespace from different Hadoop distributions, and we're demonstrating today, I think, Hortonworks and Cloudera, because it turns out that a lot of the banks, a lot of the financial services companies, are not really settling on one particular distribution. They want two, maybe three distributions. So when you say you make, <coughs> make uh, Yarn data center aware, you, you're talking about resource negotiation and job scheduling across data centers? Across data centers, <coughs> because if, if you think about it, there are countries where you cannot remove mm -hmm. data. Right. Saudi Arabia, Australia recently, Argentina, Germany, Germany, exactly. Yeah. You can't remove data. So what do you do? How do you how do you run fraud analysis if you're a bank? This, this is a real use case, of course. When you've got data in all these different, you know, if you're using your credit card in Germany, how can I query that data? Right, I'm not allowed to remove that data from Germany. So you have to be able to run a MapReduce job across multiple data centers. We enable that. It's, it's really cool technology. That is cool. Well, the, yeah, the interesting thing is, you know, we're seeing from our, our community um, a recent uh, survey of analytic, big data analytics adoption. Um, it was an astonishingly high number. I think it was over 70% of practitioners that have uh, Hadoop deployed in multiple data centers. Yeah. So now the next yeah. question then is, well, are they trying to connect these data centers or are they isolated pockets? Kind of related to what you mentioned about seeing different distributions. We're also hearing from, you know, especially the large kind of tele telecom companies, banks as well, that they're using multiple distributions. You might have the security team using MapR to, to parse uh, and analyze data relative to fraud, and you might have the product development team bringing in data, you know, phoning home from their products using uh, Hortonworks. So you've got different distributions. Um, but ultimately, if you can tie those together, because one of the benefits of big data, of course, is you don't know where these correlations are going to be found. You don't know what data sets are going to relate to one another. And if you can tie those together into a virtual data lake and run jobs across all that data, well, now you're in a position where, well, data scientists would just, would just love to have that, that data. And that's a good point. I mean, no disrespect to my product management team. And I mean that, guys, no disrespect <laughs> to you. But these ideas come from customers. You know, we're, we're gather, as, as Hadoop gathers pace in the marketplace, these use cases are coming out, and I'm, I'm hammering our sales team. Every single account we go into, I want to understand exactly what the business use case is. Mm -hmm. So I'm also curious, you mentioned the, some of the banks that you're having uh, some success with, and one of the things we're trying to kind of squint through here at Wikibon is, what are some of the characteristics of some of the early adopters that are having success? Because you know, we, we <coughs> we've done some research around ROI, and, and frankly, a lot of early adopters are struggling. Yeah. This is hard stuff. But there are, of course, those, you know, those handful of companies that are doing it well. What are some of the characteristics that you see in, in companies that are doing this well? That's a great question. And I think there is um, a couple of characteristics. Number, And it's all related to the same thing, really. The ones that are not successful, what they do is they go and create a data lake, pour data into it, and it's the build it and they will come mentality. And guess what? Nobody comes, right? It's the, whether you have a business driver, and I go back to the, the major bank that were looking at, are we making money in this geo region? That is not trying to boil the ocean. It's a very succinctly defined use case that's a, that has a clear business driver. Those are successful. It's the, it's the yeah, we, we're going to build it. The IT department says, yeah, we're going to build a data lake. This is not an IT problem, guys. This is a business problem. And it's it, the, the driver for Hadoop adoption, with the reason it's picking up pace, the reason that we're seeing it so quickly is because it's the board of directors down. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. So in, in this survey, <coughs> we asked people, you know, to what degree has your, your Hadoop or big data uh, projects uh, succeeded? And the IT guys, in a huge way, said, success, you know, job done, mission accomplished. We, we're there, 100% of the value. And we asked, so, so I think it was what, 60%? Say it was about 60% or 60 so of the IT guys said success. Only less than 20% of the business yeah. said it was success. And so the real dissonance between the IT guys saying, hey, the Hadoop cluster's up, it works, yep. you know, it didn't fail, we, we got it going. You know, we learned how to write a MapReduce job, whereas the business guys were saying, wait a minute, what was this? I don't get it. So, so if you look at the, the average ROI on Hadoop projects, it's right now small. For every dollar they spend, it's 55 cents in return, but that's the mean. Yeah. You know, if you find the guys that are the best of the best, they're getting huge return. 
it, it's, it's such an interesting discussion. When you, go to the, when you go to the IT department, sometimes the IT guys will just say, well, we can do this with Exadata, or we can do this with our, yeah. existing, t our existing technology. You go to the business guy, the business guy talks about storage cost. They talk about the potential business use cases associated with lots and lots of data. They can, I, the business, the business guys, not the tech guys here, are the visionaries. I think. Right. Right. So well, yeah, it's very difficult to make the business case for storing the amounts of data we're talking about in a more traditional system. Because yeah, you, even if you know they're running up against performance issues, but even if you could do it, any uh, insights you find that might save you some money or make you some money, you're going to be offset by the millions that you're pouring into companies like Oracle and others. On those huge scale-up proprietary boxes, we went to speak to a, a pretty major um, government department. Um, I'm going to have to try and skirt around and not revealing what this is, but they wanted to monitor HL7 traffic, right, mm -hmm. all the healthcare traffic, and look for things like Ebola breakouts and so on, right? Because you can do it if you can store all that data. The only reason that they've never done it is the cost. Mm. Like, that's what it boils down to. It would have cost them several billion dollars to do this with Oracle, right? That's that, the technology's kind of there-ish. You know, I, I mean, it, I, we had a, a guy, uh, we had the CTO of SunGuard, uh, Steve come and speak at, a, at an event that we did uh, earlier this week, and he said, you know, big data was actually invented in Wall Street, we just didn't tell anybody about it. They've, mm. Wall Street's always been dealing with long, large quantums of data. And it really, is the, it's the, the simple fact is, is that nobody could afford to do it in the past, and now we can. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about capital markets. We have our event uh, this evening, you guys are a public company, but there's a real, lack of sort of real big data public companies. I mean, there's you guys, I mean, I guess Splunk, Tableau, Click, but they're sort of on the, they're on the periphery. Yeah. Everybody's kind of waiting for that big data IPO and trying to, Wall Street's trying to figure out, well, how do I play big data? Um, mm -hmm. What's your take on what's going on? Companies seem to be raising money, staying private. You know, you're of course uh, in, in Europe, public yep. company in Europe, so maybe a little bit less onerous than it is in the US. Um, what's your take on all, everything that's so going on there? So about 20% there or thereabouts of our shareholder base are actually US investors, pretty, pretty large investment funds in the, here, here in the US. They're all desperate for, frankly, for Cloud Era to, do, to get this IPO done. Mm -hmm. um, and so are we, um, because it will, when we start to get those numbers from companies like Cloud Era, Hortonworks and so on, out there in the marketplace, people will then see the you know, the herd mentality, the herd moving in this direction, because we'll be able to see the real numbers. At the moment, of course, with private companies, you can't really see what the, uh, w what the numbers look oh, like. Well, there's a huge appetite for, for big data public companies. I mean, you've seen it. Yeah. I mean, massive demand. And uh, I mean, with the amount of money that's raised, uh, I mean, the only logical exit for many of these is IPO, right? Y well, I mean, a $4 billion or whatever it was, $5 billion valuation that Cloudera got from the investment that Intel made. I mean, have you ever seen anything like that before in no. your life? I mean, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, that, that's kind of, they don't need to go public well, right now. Well, I mean, well exactly. That, <coughs> right? right, well, that's the yeah. challenge. I, I, Clutter bought itself a lot of time there. So, I mean, yeah. I think more likely you're going to see Hortonworks and MapR be the first Hadoop provider to, to, to hit the public market. I spoke to a fund manager last week who, who had a bet with me that they would do a $10 billion IPO next year. That we will see. That, that, that Cloudera would? Yes. Or, yeah. I, d I've, I don't know, I've got no, in, uh, no inside information, but that's what he said. He said, I bet you that they do. He's a pretty smart investor and, as well. And you've been saying that you think Hortonworks is going to go first. Well, it, to, to me, they don't, to, right? well, Clatter doesn't need to raise the money right now. I mean, uh, they've just raised nearly a billion dollars in the last year. Um, Hortonworks, you know, to keep up with that, maybe they need to go public sooner rather than later. Uh, MapR, same situation. They're, you know, they sometimes get left, left out of that conversation, but to me, they're, they're right in that conversation, but they, they may need, need cash to, to keep but, up. But is, isn't it interesting, because a year ago, two years ago, we were all saying, when is XYZ company going to acquire Hortonworks, going right. to acquire Cladera? Now we're not talking about that. Mm. Now we're talking about when are these companies going to go public, because they're the disruption. Yeah. Well, but that's an interesting question, is you know, how are the big players going to adapt here in this world, Oracle, Teradata, SAP? Are they going to make some acquisitions? Um, you know, it seems like the ones we talked about are more on, on, on the path to IPO, but there's nothing stopping Oracle from making an acquisition in this space. I mean, if you look at the, the floor down at Hadoop World, there's a million startups out there doing interesting things. I mean, what stops them from, from I uh, think making an acquisition? I think we've seen this, this movie played out before, though, haven't we? When we, his, we had these things called mainframes, and then there was a bridge over to three-tier client server, and the bridge technology there was screen scraping, right? Because we, want, we wanted to make a mainframe work inside a PC. Now we have this thing, this thing called Hadoop and Big Data, 
and the bridge is things like Impala that's make, that means that SQL can run on top of Hadoop. I just think that's a load of baloney. I, d I don't think that market, just like the screen scraping marketplace, is going to be around for very long. And I don't think Hortonworks and Cloudera need to be acquired. And I think it's that there's a dilemma, right? It's that back to that graph where budgets are doing that, data's doing that. They can't adapt their business models. In the public market, you're not allowed to do it. Because what happens is, and I, I may be teaching uh, grannies to suck eggs here, is you, they're out there in the marketplace. That their shareholders are mature shareholders. What do, they, what do mature shareholders want in the mature phase of a company? They want cash. They want yeah. dividends. What, uh, th what do our shareholders want? Our shareholders want growth. We're allowed to do all that sort of stuff. If we wanted to change our business model, I'm not saying it would be a good idea, we could. Companies like Oracle can't. Right. It's impossible for them to suddenly say, you know what, we're going to stop selling all this expensive hardware and we're going to move our entire, pivot our entire business. I'm not picking on Oracle, by the way, they're a partner of ours. We're going to pivot our entire business and go down this, this path. That you, you, they just can't do it. It's well, very hard. But, it's a, it, it, but the other hard part about that is that you know, Oracle throws off what, $15 billion of free cash flow in the last four quarters. Yeah, absolutely. And they're getting punished for lack of growth. Yeah. So it's I, hard. E EMC figured this out. When, yeah. they, when they said, okay, data center is going to be less hardware centric, we're going to create VMware, we're going to spin VMware off, and they still own whatever it is, 50% of VMware. 80, 80%. 80, 80 yeah. And they've done exactly the same thing with Pivotal. And as well. I don't know if it's a pretty smart it, but there's a big pressure from Elliott Management to, to, yeah. to have VMware spun off out of yeah. EMC, which I think you're right. I think Tucci and company figured it out, and that would be a disaster long term for Absolutely. them. But of course, short term, it would unlock a bunch of I I value inside of EMC. That's how you do it. T to your question, yeah. you you have to do it the way that EMC are doing it. You you you. If you can't beat them, you join them. Well, interesting that more companies don't do that. I mean, that federation model is 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 pretty unique. I mean, IBM's pretty much got the whole thing in. Oracle certainly, when it buys companies, it red washes them and. Well, you know, yeah. CEOs don't like having other CEOs right alongside them. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think, that, again, I think that's the brilliance of Tucci, very open-minded, and of course, he's, he, we, he, if one of these days he's going to retire. <laughs> I'm not sure when. All right, David, well, listen, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. It's always a pleasure riffing on uh, the, the trends. Good luck with everything in, uh, in WAN Disco, and, and thanks again for coming by. Always a pleasure, guys. All right, keep it right there, everybody. This is theCUBE. We'll be back from Big Data NYC right after this. <laughs>